what stats do you use to track your teams? Um, we, you know, we, we've throughout the years, we've done a variety of different things. I mean, I think the, the ones that have been uh, most constant um, first is uh, plus minus. Um, you know, I know that in, in today's hockey world and the, the big analytic, analytics guys um, tend to, to poo poo plus minus a bit and say that it's not a great indicator of much. Um, you know, I find that, that at our level um, that it's still a pretty important stat. You know, ultimately, um, you know, guys were on the ice for more goals than they than they are against. Um, especially here, where you know we do, we do try to run three four lines every year. You know, we're, we're not a team that uh, tries to rely too heavily on just the top line or a top six where you know, they're out there significantly more than, than other lines. And we want, we want to run it. So guys are out there relatively evenly. And, um, you know, so if you look at it in that sense, you know, I do think that plus minus is, is pretty important, especially on the, on the back end for defensemen. Um, you know, if you're, if you're out there for goals, more goals for than goals against you're, you're out there in a positive way. Um, and, and so we, we do, we do still look at that, um, you know, and then we look at, um, you know, honestly, a lot of basic stuff. We look at uh, hits. We track hits uh, every game. And we want at least 50-plus hits a game from our guys. And, and that doesn't have to be a big hit. It's more of getting to the body to separate the puck. And, and um, we're a team that wants the puck. And the most effective way to get that puck back is to, is to separate the man, the man from the puck. Um, and so guys who are – who are doing that tend to be playing the brand of hockey that we want to play. And those are the guys who should probably be out there um, more often, especially in those crunch, crunch time moments. Um, you know, again, you want the puck, a face-off is a great way to get that puck. And, and um, again, especially at those crunch times, if you've got a guy who's been hot that day and, you know, is, is gone, you know, eight for 10, eight for 11, something like that. Well, that's the guy that, that you're going to want to put out there in, in those moments. Um, and shots, uh, we always track shots. And, you know, with the the, uh, the video breakdown programs that are out there today, um, Huddle and, and other uh, companies that break down the video for you and, and are able to track that stuff pretty quickly. I and mean, we usually get a turnaround within 24 hours on that. And uh, it comes with a pretty shot chart, shows you where the, sh the shots are from, um, as well as, uh, you know, how many you had, how many you gave up, um, and uh, who had how many for you. Um, you know, I think that guys who obviously um, get more shots tend to have the puck a lot more in the offensive zone, um, especially if they're taking a lot of those shots from prime scoring areas. Uh, that's that's something that is very helpful to know uh, as you're making lineup decisions, as you're making uh, game time decisions. Cool, sounds good. Um, just to follow up, do you uh, do you and your staff look at similar stats when you're um, when you're recruiting? Or I know it's kind of difficult to find sometimes, especially you know to that granularity. So is that something that you guys try to mix in? Um, you know, I, I think it's something that we try to track a little bit informally when we are, you know, watching kids. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to get stats on kids anyways. Um, you know, certainly you go to the, you know, the old school youth hockey mode of, of uh, points being significantly inflated and um, not being accurate to begin with. Uh, and then just a lot of organizations just don't have – uh, don't don't keep track of it. They don't have the capability. They don't have manpower to be able to do it. Um, but that that's hard, hard. Uh, you know, certainly when we are watching, um, we're looking for kids who produce in those areas. You know, we're watching for kids who are willing to get to the body. We're watching for kids who have the puck a lot, who win faceoffs, who block shots, um, who who get a lot of shots. Um, you know, so. Formally, no, um, and, and it, the biggest piece of that is it's it's just not wholly available. Uh, you know, a lot of the recruiting that we're doing uh, comes in the summer, uh, it comes in the fall, it comes in the spring tournaments, and uh, oftentimes you're watching kids where they're they're not on a regular team. You know, it's just a it's just a tournament team, it's a showcase team. Um, but when we do get into regular season stuff, um, you know, certainly you know, some of the websites do a good job, like the tier one website does a good job of tracking points and things like that. 
um, you know, the, some of the high school programs do a good job. So it, it is something that we will look at in those cases. And, and you know, points are the easy one. Um, but ultimately, you know, they can also be a good indicator. Um, you know, if a kid doesn't, doesn't produce at the level that they're coming from, um, it, it's going to be a pretty safe bet that, that they're probably not going to produce much at this level. Uh, and, and then beyond here as well, you know, if a kid doesn't produce here, it's going to be tough for them to, to catch on at the, at the higher levels of, of college hockey and, and certainly beyond that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, we also, um, we, we try to capture and consolidate that on the website to try to make it easier. And we do prorate it a lot um, based on the level of hockey it's at too, because th that's difficult because there's a lot of kids that are out there that are maybe not playing at the top level because their parents don't know how important it is to get them recruited or, or various other reasons. And they put up big points and sometimes that gets discounted because of the level they're at. So we try to level that off on the web side a little bit from, you know, proving uh, the level as well as the age of the kids they're competing against and, and things like that. So, um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we see a lot and it's hard for you guys to get that information a lot. So. And that's, you know, the, the other piece of it, it's hard is that, um, you know, especially in 2020, 2021 with COVID and, um, you know, the inability to actually get out on the road and, and watch kids live. Uh, you know, you're trying to watch these things over video um, and, and gauging the level of play over video is probably the hardest piece of watching video. Uh, and, you know, you can watch a kid who is doing everything you want to see from a kid but it's hard to say who he's doing it against and you know, how well would that be able to translate uh, to this level? Yeah. So, um, you know, when you're also doing practices and games, what do you use during, you know, as far as probability goes, what do you use as key factors and probability? You're talking about the statistics and what you look for and plus minus and stuff like that. But you know, there's certain types of shots that might be, you know, better percentage shots. There's certain types of places on the ice that might be a better place to shoot from. And I'm sure that comes into some of the play, not just from a coaching standpoint, but from a practice standpoint. Can you elaborate a little bit, a little bit on that? Yeah, you know, I think we certainly, um, you know, not, especially when it comes to things like shots, you know, not every shot is, is created equal. And, um, you know, you may look at a kid who has, you know, eight shots in the game and, and five of them maybe from the, the half wall on the far side, just kind of throwing it into the net, uh, which, you know, is not a high probability play and is, is oftentimes not a good play at all. Um, the one thing that we, a couple of things that we, we talk to our guys about a lot is, you know, where are you shooting from? Um, and, and we try to teach them about kind of the softer area and yourself in the middle of the slot at the hash marks and calling for the puck and thinking that that puck's going to get to you and you're going to be able to wind up and, and blast a, a one time game. Um, and it's just not, uh, it's not a useful thing to practice per se. Um, you know, we talk to our guys about getting into the, the higher points of the slot, um, you know, the tops of the circles area on the outside a little bit, uh, being able to get your sticks in the right lane, you know, knowing where the lanes are and, and putting your stick in that lane because that's the pass that's most likely to be able to get through to you. Um, <clears throat> we talk about one timing pucks and quick releases and things like that, because um, again, you know, the probability of you being able to, to get off a perfect shot every time is minimal. Um, but if you get it off quick, if you're one time, it, you know, the goalie can't set, the goalie can't get across. You're then putting yourself in a position where you don't have to be perfect. And, um, and that then, you know, makes it more likely that that shot is going to be productive and not necessarily in the back of the bowl, but, um, you know, that something positive for us can come from that, whether it's a scrum in front, whether it's a good rebound, uh, something along those lines. Um, and we talk, I mean, to me, probability as well is, is related directly just that kind of hockey IQ, um, and figuring out, you know, what's the right play at the right time. Um, you know, it, you hear coaches all the time that talk about, you know, making, making good decisions and, and, you know, you've been out, you know, for example, they talk a lot about, you know, you've been out on the ice for a minute, um, pucks on your stick. 
you're in the D zone. You've got the lane to get to the red. What should you do? Well, you should get to the red line and, and get it deep and, and get off the ice and get some fresh legs out. Well, you know, well, maybe you have a one on one, a one on two, a one on three. Well, now being able to read that, and what is the, the best outcome for, for each of those? Um, early in the ship, late in the ship. You know, you see all the time guys trying to force plays uh, that aren't there. Um, and sometimes it gets through, uh, but you know when it does, and when it does get through, it often looks pretty, right? Um, <laughs> but but if it only gets through one out of every ten times you're doing it, and three of those ten go back the other way, and and six turn out to be you know relatively nothing plays, well, is that a play that that you should make? Um, and I think part of the issue that, that we start to see a lot. Uh, you know, and have over the last couple of years is a lot of times kids are, are trying to, to make those plays and trying to do too much uh, because, because they have the skill to do it. And, and those are the skills that they, that they're working on all the time with skill coaches and, and kind of the drills that they like to do on their own when they get puck time or, or things like that, as opposed to, uh, um, you know, relying on the hockey IQ and making, making the right play. The, the right play often isn't the prettiest play, uh, but the right play is usually the best play to make at that at that moment. Yeah, I, for sure. You um, see it at all levels. Like I, I was laughing the other night with the, in the Ranger game. Um, or, you know, I don't know what that means. Oh, if you like, series. I can search the web for. <laughs> um, you know, watching the Ranger game, the Rangers have a have a two one lead late and. Uh, the Penguins pull the goalie with, you know, just under two minutes left. And, and obviously with the Penguins firepower, that's, that's a long time uh, to be down six on five. And yeah. uh, the Rangers do a good job and create a turnover in, in the high slot. Uh, and Brendan Lemieux puck on his stick. Uh, and to me, while watching it, and certainly I'm nor could I ever play at that level. So, you know, here I am just to talk in head a little bit. But um, to me, he, there's, there was a lane to that outside where he could have chipped it out to himself, be on the red and, and um, you know, gotten it deep or, or you know, tried to take that D-man one-on-one into the zone and, and get the empty net that way. And instead, it, you know, in that moment, he fires it all the way down, trying to put it in the back of the net from, from the high slot in his own zone, icing. Um, and and yeah. you know, we're playing the Penguins and Crosby's out there and, and Marino and, and Malkin. Like that's just not a that's not a great spot to now have to be a six on five offensive zone or defensive zone face off for him. Yeah, right. Yeah, no. Often, often it's the little plays that that make uh, you know that make the good teams. It's the Patrice Bergerons that like are 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 sneaky. They make the good. They make the smart play all the time. Yeah, and those often be the are like the better players. Um, but so just just one last like statistics based question: Do you find that um, that you guys seem to keep a lot of detailed stats about your players? Do you find that that helps in in your discussions with college and junior coaches in helping get your your players recruited? I think it does. Um, you know, I think it's also uh, you know kind of player specific a little bit though. Um, you know, obviously, uh, for the, the higher end guys, um, you know, those guys are obvious, uh, you know, the, the, you know, some of the guys we've had in the past, like Cam Donaldson and Alex Jeffrey and, um, Gustav Weston, those guys, like you guys, guys see those guys play and, and you don't have to have those, those conversations, um, at all because, you know, their, their talent is, is obvious. Um, but, you know, for example, um, we had a kid uh, who graduated last year, uh, Dave Dandrichuk, who is committed to Samus. Um, and, you know, you watch David. In order to, to really appreciate him, uh, you've got to watch him play multiple times. Um, you know, he can be relied on to, to win faceoffs. He can be relied on to, to be in a good position. He sees the ice extraordinarily well. And, and you know, last year, it was great. Like he made a big jump for us. He put up almost 50 points, you know, maybe even a little more than 50 points. So he had statistically, he still had a, a great year and that jumps off the page. But to me, he's a guy who will, you know, 
be able to continue to play um, at college and beyond because he does all of those little things that when you just watch him once, uh, it doesn't jump off the page. But when you, when you watch him over and over and you start to see the face off and you start to see uh, some of the turnovers he's able to create by keeping the stick in a lane in the D zone and, and those types of things, um, you know, that, that that's what will separate him later on. Uh, and, and in those cases, you know, that's definitely the stuff that we talk to college and junior guys about um, because, you know, just like we have very limited uh, time in terms of uh, recruiting and being able to see kids in person and all of that, colleges and junior programs aren't any different. Um, and they're not, ultimately, they're probably not going to watch a kid play 10 times in a season. Um, it's just not realistic. And so uh, being able to, to show them some of that stuff and talk, talk with them about some of that stuff can be really important for those guys. So um, without embarrassing someone in your organization, um, why don't you give us one of the funniest hockey stories that you have from your, uh, from your days there at the school? Oh, God. Um, so we had a few years ago, um, we, we had, a, you know, one of the better teams that we've ever had here and, um, in kind of all facets, you know, we, we were, were very, but we also had just a really good group of guys and guys who really bought into it. They loved the school. Uh, they loved each other, uh, you know, going down there, you know, even at, at kind of low moments was, was always a blast. Um, and we had a, a goalie on the team who, who was our third goalie. Um, and he, you know, he was clearly our third goalie. Uh, awesome guy, though. really good locker room guy. Uh, you know, best friends with, and, and like sincerely best friends. Like he wasn't like a mascot best friend. Like he, he was best friends with all the guys on the team. And uh, there was a, we were running a drill and he was in net and it, he kind of out of nowhere um, and for like kind of no explained reason, just skated as hard as he could out of the net and just like late, like center fielder, laid out arms out to try to catch a puck that was just literally was just dumped into the zone. Like it was, like it was a start of the start of a drill where he's just supposed to be in the net and unexplained. He just skated out as hard as he could and dove for it. Um, he then the next drill, um, you know, made it, made a couple of really bizarre plays that, um, basically scored on himself in the drill and you know it just it, w it was late in the season you know we were pushing uh, for a playoff spot and it was just one of those moments that just everybody that uh, you know just kind of fell on the ice laughing um, and, and really kind of you know not only uh, a memorable moment but you know it was really one of those moments that you know at, at a tough time at a stressful time for the team just kind of relaxed everybody and, and brought it back to what it should be, which is just having fun, you know, playing yeah. the game. Yeah, it's always the goalies. They lighten it up. The goalies will lighten it up for sure. That's awesome. Um, so just to, to <laughs> um, so just to, we just have one or two more uh, for you, but so if we yep. were to, so, so part of the, thought that we have with these videos is that we can, you know, have these meetings with the coaches and then kind of, you know, analyze their team, their past teams when they've been there, just kind of, kind of supplement the video with like a list of players. Um, so if you, if you could yeah. maybe off the top of your head, um, you know, if we were to make like a, a like dirty dozen, as we call it, a list of, of your top players, maybe just a couple that you think would be, would be on that list. And then, you know, maybe a couple that you think, should be on that list, but would be more of the diamonds and the rough kind of guys, the guys with the really good plus minus that might not produce the points, um, you know, that, that are those diamonds mm -hmm. and the rough kind of kids. Ooh, how, how long, how far back do you want me to go? Well, that's, there's a reason we do like a, we call it a dirty dozen <laughs> because we basically make it like a, uh, you know, 12 players. So we make it uh, six forwards, four D two goalies. Um, and we usually do that for all our lists, 
but now we're going to ask you put you on the spot and say okay what is if you had a dirty dozen and you don't have to give us the whole dirty dozen but that's how we do it on our website give us who you would say okay here's my you know my top two lines of forwards my top two lines of d and the goalie and the backup goalie that i'd have just in case Gosh, doesn't have to be that doesn't have to be that many guys you know <laughs> but well, i could i could pick it easily well the hard part is breaking it down if i want i'll go i'll go for um since i've been the head coach here so um we'll go back the last six years of, going back 16 years would make it um would make it even tougher <laughs> Um, but you know, if we want to go that that dirty dozen, you know, are, are the I think the the top forwards. I mean, obviously, you're going to go with with Alex Jeffries, um, Cam Donaldson, Gustav Westland. Um, probably then go with like a, a Mark Gatcomb. Um, probably Robert Cronin uh, and. Probably the Agostino. Uh, after that, um, you know, you're certainly going with a with a lot of firepower there, um, but also a couple of guys in, in Cronin, um, Gustav, uh, who you know really play all three zones in CD Ice really, really well. Uh, make good, smart plays. On D, I'd probably go with um, Jimmy Rayhill off the top. Um, Guillermo Demuro. Um, then I'd probably go back. Uh, you know, two guys who who were on the same team um, and who were you know, really anchored the um, when we won the New England Championship. Uh, probably go with Connor Dolman and um, and Gagne. Um, you know, those two guys were were dynamite uh, day in and day out for us and. Um, and goal, obviously, I, I, our top guy would be Trevin Kozlowski, um, who I just his dad uh, just sent me a link that uh, he was put on the the Richter Award watch list today, uh, which is great for him. Um, and then I'd probably go. Uh, he was only here for one year, um, you know, but he was he could be dynamite. Uh, Cedric Andre, uh, who's up with uh, the sixty sevens up in up in Ottawa right now. Certainly, the forwards makes it makes it hard because uh, there you know there are a lot of guys who could be on that list and um, you know going to like a Daniel Hyder, Albert Washko, um, Pellegrino, Noah Williams, Matt Danner, um, guys who you know had great great careers here um, and who were good, really good all around uh, kids and players. So you talk about all these you know all these great players that you've had through the history and such. Some of them you knew, like you said, you talk about some kids, you didn't need the statistics to prove how good they were and people knew about them. Tell me one or two players that came in, you, you kind of recruited them, but you never thought they were going to be as special as they were at the end. Uh, I think two people, um, you know, one, one obvious to me right off the bat, and then the one who won't sound as obvious in, in some ways, but I think one, one would be Alex Jeffries, honestly. Um, you know, I think he we so we recruited him um, for two years before he came, and, and he was actually supposed to come to us the year before he did, and he was supposed to come as a repeat freshman. Um, and it was all set to go. Uh, no one, no one really knew him. You know, he he was playing up for for the Islanders. Um, he was undersized. Uh, good but you know kind of com completely off the radar and we watched him a few times and ironically because he's he's now a wing and he really played wing for us too but at the time like i thought he's, he's a really good center like he i watched him play in a couple of games he won every face off played smart um played hard but was a little undersized and you know we thought you know what we think he can be really good um but no one you know, really knew who he was and, and all set to come. And in May, uh, they kind of pulled the plug on it. And the reason being is that the Alex just wasn't ready to, to go away from home. Um, 
he just wanted to stay at home another year. So then they would kind of reevaluate. And uh, so he did, and he stayed home. And then, you know, that next year, he really started to take off. Um, and I think he led the USPHL 16s in scoring by like, I don't know, by like 40 points or something like that. Um, and, and that's when Merrimack committed him. Um, and, you know, he still ended up, obviously, came to us that following year. Uh, but when we first were on him, you know, we thought he would be pretty good, uh, you know, but we really had no idea that he would turn into uh, the player that he has today. Um, the second one being uh, Mark Gatcom. Um, you know, we lost a kid in the summer um, one year and, you know, we're looking to replace that kid and, and Mark kind of came through our radar and he had, you know, he just played at, at Wilburn High School and he just finished up his junior year there and, uh, was was a good player, um, but another one who was really off the radar. You know, was never considered like a top kid in mass by any stretch of the imagination, and never really played for any of those top teams out there. Uh, and we watched some video on him. Um, you know, he was a good sized kid. He's a very good baseball player. You know, so we knew he was going to be a, a good athletic kid. Uh, comes from a really good family, um, and so. You know, we kind of were like, all right, you know, let's, let's, we need somebody, you know, it's getting late. Let's take a flyer on this kid. Um, and we figured honestly that he'd come in and be a third, fourth line guy year one. Um, and it was our hope that, uh, you know, we'd be able to, to develop him um, and to be a real impact guy his senior year. And he came in and just kind of blew our doors off, um, you know, really, really uh, strong, athletic, heavy, uh, jumped right into our, to our top six, really under our top line. I think he scored like 16 goals as a, as a junior. His first year with us put up like 25, 26 points um, and, and just was, was not uh, what we expected at all. And quickly, you know, was a top player in New England and then, you know, came back here for his senior year and went directly into UConn after that, um, and, you know, is a junior year there in his junior year there now and, and one of their top guys, uh, which, you know, for the, for the way that the hockey world and, and youth sports world in general tends to work these days and, and you know, you, you catch on to those guys who are, who are really good when they're young, oftentimes some of those other guys fall through the cracks and, and, um, for Mark could have been one of those guys. And I'm um, lucky for us, he came through to us and, and uh, became, you know, a, a really, really good player and a really good kid for us. It's easy. Talk about hockey, talk about your own kids too, which is, which is always a good, a good thing to talk about.